Hi, I'm Gregory Anders, also known as GP Anders Online. I've been on the NeoVim core team for a little over two years, but I've been using Vim and NeoVim for a lot longer than that. I've been a little bit of a terminal enthusiast for a while now. I can't explain it. Some people are just weird like that. But I think the modern terminal emulator is a fascinating piece of technology. It's cursed, but it's also incredible that very clever people that work on terminals and on terminal applications like NeoVim have come up with some really really cool solutions to some of the problems that terminal emulators have faced over the years. In this talk today, I'm going to help you appreciate terminals, hopefully a little bit as much as I do. If you are a NeoVim user, which you most likely are if you're here at NeoVim Conf 2023, then the terminal is almost certainly an everyday part of your life. Whether you love it or you hate it, or you just don't know anything about it, hopefully I can convince you that it is at least a little bit cooler than you might have thought. So let's get started. To start off, we'll talk a little bit about the background and history of terminal emulators. To do that, we're gonna step back in time to the year 1978. In 1978, try to picture it, Microsoft is a tiny little company based out of Albuquerque, New Mexico, and they just sell basic interpreters. Apple is a small computer company that has just started selling the Apple II, the very first personal computer, and a research lab in New Jersey called Bell Labs has just developed a new operating system called Unix using a new high-level language that they're calling C on a uh, targeting a mainframe called a PDP-11. And the PDP-11 is made by a company called the Digital Equipment Corporation, or DEC for short. DEC also sells a line of video terminals that they call their VT product line. And in 1978, they've just released their newest model that would go on to become extremely popular called the VT-100. Like other VT products before it, the VT100 is a descendant of teletype machines, which are also known as TTYs, which might sound familiar to you. They're connected to mainframes over a serial connection or a, or a telephone wire, and the mainframe is shared by multiple users. So if you're sitting at a VT100 or any other terminal, you're, you're time sharing the mainframe with anyone else who's on the system at the same time as you. Most terminal emulators today are, to some degree, VT100 emulators because they were so popular that they became the de facto standard that every other terminal that came after it copied. Which brings us to the next stop in our history lesson, Xterm. In 1984, a student at MIT named Mark Vandevoort started working on a software emulator of the DEC VT series. This eventually became integrated into the X Windows system and became known as Xterm, which most of us have probably heard of today. Over time, Xterm became the terminal that other terminals themselves emulated. Xterm integrated new features from newer v DEC VT models and eventually, of course, added many features of its own as well. So that's it for the history lesson. Let's now give a really brief overview of how terminal applications work and how they communicate with the terminal emulator itself. The most important thing to understand about how terminals work is what's called escape sequences. These are sequences of characters that an application running in the terminal can write that begin with an escape character. Not every sequence of characters that starts with an escape is meaningful. There are a predefined set of sequences that applications can use and that terminals understand. And different escape sequences have different prefixes. Some of the most common I've listed here, which are the CSI or control sequence introducer, which is an escape character followed by a left square bracket, the operating system command or OSC, which is an escape character followed by the right square bracket, and the device control string or DCS, which is an escape character followed by the letter P. As an example, we can write the words hello world in red text to our terminal by writing this command in our shell, which we can demo right now. In the next part of our talk, we'll t discuss some of the problems that terminal applications have faced over the years and how some of those have been solved or at least made less painful. Problem one, key encoding. Applications can't distinguish between different control sequences sent by different keyboard keys. Solution, use a different encoding. So the problem here is basically illustrated by this table. If you've used Vim or NeoVim or any other terminal-based editor for any amount of time, you've almost certainly run into this. For example, the keys on a, a standard US keyboard, Tab, Control-I, and Control-Shift-I all send the exact same sequence of bytes to the application running the terminal. This means that, for example, NeoVim literally cannot distinguish between these three key presses. Even though they're, of course, different keys on the keyboard, and to a user's perspective, they're totally different, 
NeoVim cannot tell a difference whatsoever. And this is true for other key sequences as well. The return or enter key sends the same thing as control M, which sends the same thing as control shift M. The reason for this is complicated and goes into ASCII and the way that ASCII is encoded. We won't talk about that here. If you're curious, you can find a lot of really interesting resources about that online. So how do we solve this problem? Well, there were a couple of different proposed solutions. As early as 2006, at the request of an Emacs user, Thomas Dickey, the maintainer of Xterm, introduced something that he called the modify other keys option. When this was enabled, it encoded certain key presses like control I or control M differently than it did tab or the return key. Now this mostly worked, but not everyone was satisfied with it. So Paul Evans, also known as Leonard online, came up with his own proposal, which he called fixed terms in circa 2010. This proposal is also sometimes known as CSIU. The fixed terms or CSIU approach was similar in spirit to X terms modify other keys in the sense that it used a separate encoding for certain key sequences, but the encoding was entirely different, and at least according to Evans, was superior to X term Sloan solution. X term itself would go on to add another option to allow users to enable this CSIU encoding if they wanted to. So X term technically supports both. Later, Kovid Goyal, the author of the Kitty terminal emulator, created his own proposal, which later became known as the Kitty Keyword Protocol which extended on Paul Evans's fixed terms or CSIU proposal. The Kitty Keyword Protocol has by far become the most common and most popular of these three options. And you'll find it supported in most modern terminal emulators. I know for sure that iTerm2 and Ghosty and WesTerm and Foot all support it, although all of those, as far as I know, also support the Xterm modify other keys encoding as well. NeoVim understands the Kitty Keyword Protocol as well as Xterms modify other keys. Any of these solutions can be used to solve the problem. With the Kitty Keyword Protocol enabled, we can see that all of our keys now have unique encodings. Whereas before these three keys were completely indistinguishable from any application running in the terminal, now they all have unique encodings. So an, an editor or an application like NeoVim can distinguish between tab, control I, and control shift I. As a quick demo of how this works, I have NeoVim open here, and you can see I've created three key mappings, one for Control-I, one for Control-Shift-I, and one for Tab. And you'll see that each of these mappings just displays the key that was pressed. And if you look down here in the echo area, as I press each key, you'll see that each of these keys is uniquely understood by NeoVim. Problem two. Applications can't really do anything fancier than simple colors, bold, italic, or reverse, also known as standout. Solution, add all new kinds of fancy crap. Underlines, colored and squiggly underlines, full 24-bit color, images, and more. Terminal emulator authors have added lots of features to enable terminal applications to do some really neat things. Not all of these are relevant to NeoVim, but some of these are really nice to have. Color and styled underlines allow you to have something like red squiggly underlines under misspelled words. There are some control sequences that allow applications to update the terminal colors dynamically. We'll see a demo of this in just a second. And there are a few different image protocols that are very popular, and each of these has varying levels of support. Sixels, I think, is interesting because the history goes back quite a long way. Sixels was, was short for six pixels. It was first created by DEC, the very same DEC that created the VT100, but it was originally made to send bitmap graphics to dot matrix printers, not to actually show graphics in the terminal display itself. iTerm2 has its own image display protocol, and of course, Kitty, Kitty has their graphics protocol that's becoming pretty popular as well. Different terminals support different image protocols. There's not really a clear winner yet, as far as standardization, but I think we'll see a winner emerge in the next couple of years. I have a link here to this website, charm.sh, which I highly recommend looking at if you haven't already seen it. They do some really, really neat things with terminal UIs, and I think is a really co cool showcase to see what is possible with terminal UIs today. We'll quickly demo some of the things that terminal emulators can do now when, in regards to things like colors and graphics and images. First, we'll run this script that I wrote that just changes the colors dynamically. Now, it's important to recognize that this is not actually useful for anything, but you can imagine how a terminal application that wants to do something with colors might be able to do something like that. We can also, of course, display images, which we can show here. This image is displayed in full bitmap glory right here in my terminal display. It's not ASCII art or anything like that. It's a, it's a real image. I think even MPV, the video player, is able to display videos directly in the terminal in terminals that support the graphics protocol. So that's pretty neat. 
Problem three is capability determination. The problem is that applications running in the terminal need to know the capabilities of the terminal emulator that they're running in, so they know what features they can support. The solution to this is complicated. The InCurses library packages a database of what are called term info files. These are binary compiled files that map to a terminal name and list the capabilities supported by that terminal. Applications can see which terminal they're running in through the term environment variable, check the database, and know what capabilities that terminal supports. However, as any TUI application developer knows, the term info solution has some issues. Both terminal emulators and sometimes users will lie about which terminal they're using. And I put lie in scare quotes here. Of course, I'm not attributing malice to anybody, but it is, it is common to see terminals claim to be compatible or to claim to do something that they're not. Many terminals claim to be XRM 256 color compatible, but really are not. Many users will set, will override their term environment variable to be something else than what their terminal actually is as quick fixes or hacks or workarounds. And these really cause problems for uh, to terminal applications downstream. And of course, these term info databases are not always present or may be outdated. This was a real problem on Mac OS for a long time. They've only just recently, as, as in I think the most recent major release, updated their InCurses version that they bundle. This is a real function in the NeoVim code base called patch term info bugs. The comment says, patches the term info records after loading from system or built-in DDB. Several entries in term info are known to be deficient or outright wrong, and several terminal emulators falsely announce incorrect terminal types. So yes, to overcome the deficiencies with term info, we have to actually work around that at the application level. Term info is, works, it gets us most of the way there, but it has some issues. Many modern terminal emulators started shipping their own term info entries instead of relying on the database that's part of curses. This is good because we want terminals to be honest about their term info, to provide an accurate term info database, and to actually provide a database file that maps to the term environment variable. Increasingly, capabilities can be queried from a terminal emulator directly instead of relying on these term info database files. So we use this in NeoVim, for instance, for a few different features. We use this to get the background color to determine support for Kitty Keyboard Protocol and a couple of other features like OSC52 clipboard support. So this is really nice because this doesn't require term info at all. It works over remote SSH sessions, and it's, it's by far the most reliable way to determine if a terminal supports something. But the downside is that it has a lot more overhead. It's a lot slower than just reading the term info files. Problem four. Terminal applications have limited ability to interact with the broader system. The solution is to start using more operating system commands, or OSCs. Some common OSCs are OSC52, which provides clipboard integration. Terminal applications like NeoVim can read from and write to your system clipboard, even on remote SSH sessions. That's useful. OSC8 allows your terminal to show hyperlinks, and OSC9 lets applications send you desktop notifications. We'll do a quick demo of some of these OSCs in action. We'll start with OSC52 and write some text to our clipboard. So we start with our OSC prefix, which is the escape character followed by the right bracket. Then we write 52 to indicate that this is OSC52 we're using. The first parameter of OSC52 is the clipboard that we want to read from or write to. I'm using Mac OS, which only has one clipboard, so we can just leave that blank. We'll next put the contents that we want to add to our clipboard. So let's write the text, hello world. And it needs to be base64 encoded. So we'll pipe it into the base64 encoder tool. And then we use the terminator string here. This is called the ST sequence. It's an escape character followed by a backslash. And this tells the terminal emulator that it's reached the end of the OSC command. So we hit enter. And now if I paste from my clipboard, we'll see the text, hello world. Next, we'll take a look at OSC8, which lets us write hyperlinks in the terminal. So again, we have our OSC prefix, escape, followed by the right bracket, followed by the 8, to indicate this is OSC 8. And then we have our link URL and our link text, followed by the terminating sequence. So when we run this in our terminal, assuming we are in a terminal that supports OSC 8, it spits out a hyperlink. And the way that you can access this link will depend on the terminal that you're using. But in my terminal, I can hold a key and click it with my mouse. So that does it for talking about the problems of the past and some of the solutions there. 
We'll now look to the future and look at some of the things that terminal emulators today are innovating on, some features that are in development or already exist, but just haven't proliferated very far yet. So one thing that at least one terminal emulator that I know of is working on are custom shaders. This is a feature of terminals which use the GPU to do their rendering, and they allow you, the user to inject a custom shader to modify the output of the terminal. You may not have realized it, but this entire presentation so far has been running in a terminal emulator with a CRT shader effect applied. And if I just open a new tab, you'll see that it's once again just a regular old terminal emulator with no effects. I can also apply some other effects, such as a glitch effect, which looks something like this. Now, these two are both exaggerated examples that aren't particularly useful for doing anything other than showing off. But one could imagine how this could be used for something actually useful, like uh, colorblind users. One application that, that may come out of this is the ability for terminal applications to either upload or enable these shaders on demand, which could be used for terminal, which could be used for games running inside of terminal emulators or terminal native games. Or you can imagine an editor like NeoVim enabling a screen shake or other kind of visual effects in the editor itself, which could all be done with something like this. Another feature which some terminals already support is file transfer between remote machines. This is something that could be useful in some use cases. Kitty supports this, iTurn2 supports this, but you can imagine a scenario where you're working in a remote SSH session and you can just hover your mouse over a file path, maybe one that's been outputted with OSC8 to generate hyperlinks, and you can copy that file directly to your terminal, your host machine. We also might start to see more escape sequences for system interaction. One example that's being discussed right now is an escape sequence to notify the terminal application when the operating system changes from light mode to dark mode or vice versa. So you can imagine this being useful to something like NeoVim to automatically update its color scheme when the operating system changes between light and dark mode. Another interesting idea is the ability to support multiple fonts inside the terminal. This already works to some extent today because you can have different font bases for bold and italic, but it would be neat to be able to support multiple fonts for different syntactic elements. So imagine having a separate font base for doc comments versus code, like you see in Xcode. The Mona Space project from GitHub is already kind of working in this direction. Definitely check out this link if you haven't heard of this already. So that's it for my presentation. I hope that you learned something going through the history of terminals, learning about the VT100 and the roots of Xterm, learning about escape sequences and how terminals communicate with applications and vice versa. We talked about some of the problems that terminal applications have faced over time and some of the creative solutions that terminal developers and application developers have come up with to solve those problems. And we briefly looked at some of the features that might be coming in the future, which NeoVim might be able to take advantage of. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer those in the chat. I've compiled some references here with links to some of the things that we talked about. So if you're curious, there's lots of really good history here and, and background if you want to learn more. And that's it. Thank you and enjoy NeoVimConf 2023.